Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first um, quarterly leadership series um, of the CFA Society in Nigeria. For um, us as a society, a few questions have come to me around why a leadership series? Why do we want to get um, people we consider leaders in the market um, to speak to our members? Just to provide a bit of a background, um, EY conduct, conducted an, a, a research um, with 1,000 executive um, level, C-suite level. And one of the two things that were their worries, were two things they pointed as their worry. One was uh, their ability to be able to retain top talents. The second issue or concern for them was actually the conversation about leadership, succession. What's the next generation of leaders going to look like? How do they select the next generation of leaders? And so along the way, what tends to happen for most people in CISWIT is they realize that people have developed technical skills, but however, the transition from the technical skills into leadership positions become a, a difficult switch for people. So for us as CFA society, we felt that as we, pro, um, we promote ethical values in Nigerian financial market, as we ensure that um, the right and proper professionals are actually um, leading the financial institutions in Nigeria, it was important for us that even as they get the technical skills that we begin to groom our members for leadership position. And for that series, it was important for us to see that what are the qualities that are needed in a leader. And while these buzzwords around ethical values or self-development or strategic thinking exist from time to time, we thought it was important as a society to practicalize it by ensuring we get people that have lived through these um, values or characters or, or principles to speak to our members and ensure that we're getting it hands-on from people that have walked this journey and successfully done it. As a society, we're very ethical um, uh, in, our, in our values. So for us on this platform, as we begin to bring the leaders on the platform, one of the key qualities that we look for and the leaders that will be speaking on our platform will be people that we um, believe have been ethical in their journey and even the, the economy or the, or the finance industry actually align with us in their view of the ethical values. Um, because of the popularity of the event, we, it was meant to be just for our members, but due to the high demand, we've decided to open it up for the um, entire um, professional financial industry. And so going forward, we intend that we bring the speaker on um, they would actually be able to make an impact on the lives of our members and the public on what leadership should look like and what it should feel like. Um, today, um, one of the things that um, I'm getting questions like, okay, what's CFA about? What are we trying to do? And one of the things we promote is ethical values, like I said earlier on. And the other thing we also emphasize is the integrity of the capital markets and ensuring that investors, clients are actually, the interests of clients are actually put first above our own personal interests. So as we go on this journey of this conversation with our guest speaker today, um, I think in my own personal view, I think it's, it's a platform where we would have an opportunity to um, hear from someone I personally respect a lot um, from a professional perspective, but I've also worked closely with him um, on a personal level. And he, he, I, I believe he walks the talk. He actually lives his life both on the professional level and in the pe personal level on a consistent, um, on a consistent stand. And also another thing about him is his passion for the younger generation and his ability to impact um, the younger generation with the skills and knowledge he's learned over the years. Without taking so much of your, your time, I would let um, um, the moderators do the um, speaking or engaging him to actually get all the extracts, all the um, values we want to get from him today. But I'm very, very pleased to welcome you on, on board today to listen to someone I truly respect 
uh, Mr. Fola Adiola, who is the founder and the first managing director of um, Guarantee Trust Bank, now called GT Bank PLC. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And, and thank you to all the parties on this call for joining. I, I think what we are trying to do here is essentially give context into leadership and leadership from a Nigeria standpoint. I think when you look at the person who will be interviewing over the course of today, he needs no introduction, whether it's from a financial or economic sphere, as I mentioned by Bukun just now, from a social sphere, having helped uh, with, with his foundation, the Faith Foundation, or even from a political sphere, having, having uh, worked on that journey in, in, the, in the past, and also one of the most important uh, pieces of legislation to happen in the last two decades, being the Pension Reform Act, having led that. So, so I, I think it needs no introduction, but I, what we always try and do is make sure we don't, we, we don't put, uh, use our version of the person. And I'm sure uh, over the course of this call, we will hear from him. Um, um, it, I'm Samuel Sule. Uh, I, I run Rencap at night in Nigeria, and my co-moderator is Paula Benedict Faniron, who will be taking this. Um, from a parts perspective, we split this into a few parts, and we think this is the, the, the way to provide the best context and also allow for a, an interactive conversation. So we were looking at who Mr. Fola Deola is in his own words, and then moving on to his career, talking about how family interrelates with leadership. Naturally, there's the point of Nigeria, the country that we owe for, I guess, our existence or our identity, and understanding how leadership and Nigeria works. And we'll also be looking through his legacy and lessons learned for the new generation and even the current generation. I think the way we're trying to look at this is, yes, it is unedited, but we're also going to take a very pragmatic, uh, constructive and positive approach as to looking at leadership and how we move things forward, either personally or from a, from a, from a societal standpoint. So on this point, I'll pause and, and perhaps we start with the session uh, with Paula, uh, uh, starting with the first uh, question. Thank you very much again for joining and we look forward to an interactive session which will end with the Q&A at the very end. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Just a quick reminder that we will be having a Q&A session at the end, um, towards the end of this program. Kindly drop in your questions um, in the chat room and we will um, ask them um, after the interactive live, live session. Once again, thank you very much, Mr. Fole Adela, for joining this um, Made It edition of our leadership series. We'll just dive right straight in. Tell us, who is Fole Adela? How would you describe it yourself? Fole Adela is me. <laughs> <laughs> Male, Nigerian, Black, father of six children, um, investor, entrepreneur, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. How would you say your upbringing has influenced who you are today? Um, of course, that's the foundation. I mean, everybody's upbringing influences who, who, who they become. Um, your... English teacher in the nursery school, if that's where you started learning English, must be influential to how you use the language. Despite the fact that other people came in to intervene in your life. But I, 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 I grew up in a, in a large family in Lagos. I was born here and I grew up here, a very large family, uh, which grew to become 17 children. Um, of a father and a few wives, but we we grew up together, and we are still we are still together. The the discipline that was introduced very early on was very very instructive, very interesting. Uh, at some point in our lives, we stopped calling ourselves. We were instructed to stop calling ourselves by our first names. So we started calling ourselves brother this or sister that and so on and so forth. And, and that worked some discipline into, into our life. You don't call somebody brother this and he cannot effect an instruction with you. No. Um, limited punishments at the different levels and so on and so forth. Uh, it was very lonely uh, 
people can look back today and say it was very poor. Uh, but we didn't feel any, any poverty at that time, honestly. Uh, when you look back now, we wonder how did we scale this or how did we scale that? But we did scale them, um, not from the perspective of, oh, come and, come and see me how abject or how poor we were, but about being brought, being raised to accept our circumstances, but not just to keep with it, but to challenge it, even as children, um, with the hope that we are going to become doctors and, and lawyers and engineers in the future. Uh, we, weren't, we weren't brought up with disadvantages uh, uh, in our psyche to say you and these people are not the same. No, no. We are brought up with um, a clear, a clear um, uh, desire for betterment in, in the future. I, I think that blindsided us to the poverty or to the lowliness of our circumstances at the time. Thank you very much for that, and, and that's quite clear. Uh, you've painted a picture of when you were much younger and the psyche that essentially supports success and leadership. As you move through the years, perhaps in your teens, are there any experiences you can share with us that further buttress that psyche? So many. Um, schools were free. Primary schools were free. And therefore, it wasn't a burden on an already uh, trapped family to send their children to school. Uh, but everybody in life needs a golden seed. You know, that teacher that encourages you. I didn't know you before. Just find something that resonates with him or her in the class and continues to encourage you. And those are confidence boosters. Uh, three times seven uh, or whatever it is. Or that friend that is always offering to help, uh, either with your academics or with your issues, if, if, if you raise them. Um, and all through life, people run through golden seeds. I call them golden seeds. I read about golden seeds in the book, and I like the definition of people whose um, encounter with you just projects you uh, uh, and boosts your confidence to a point where you will want to see what the idea is. You want to engage what the idea is before you came to the conclusion that it's not for me. You know, not somebody suggests something and say, oh, we are out of that league. No, we are not out of any league. Let's talk about it. And if it is something I can contribute to or I can look at, um, so be it. And so I was privileged to um, primary school, secondary school, wherever I, whatever I did, I was privileged to run several golden seeds or I was equipped to, to be able to identify when I saw the golden seed because there are golden seeds around you and you, you block yourself from receiving. And when you don't receive, there's no way you can evaluate or even consider that which they're saying. You know, two people attend the lecture and at the end of the lecture, one of them said, oh, so boring. The lady was just talking rubbish. And the other one said to himself, Oh my goodness, my life will never be the same again. From the same lecture, from the same lecturer, within the same hall, two people, two different outcomes. When, when are you able to, when, how do you get yourself to a point where you first say to yourself, my time will never be wasted. And therefore, even if I find myself in a room where what is being discussed is the uh, 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 geology of petroleum, and I don't know jack about petroleum, but this is where I'm going to be for the next 30 minutes. Believe me, I'm going to listen mm -hmm. actively, attentively to what is being said. Um, what I find most of the time is that by the time I am done, I'm likely to have been interested in that topic that I can even pursue for productive endeavor. But there's an alternative. I can take my phone and I can be fiddling with uh, TikTok um, 
And then when the person I'm waiting for at the end of 30 minutes is done, says, let's go, and then we go. I, I just find that we need to account for our 30 minutes. We need to account for our one hour. Um, one of the things that I was trained to do when I was young was to learn how to read the Quran. It's written in Arabic. And it's tough. And um, I find that sometimes it's when I'm waiting for somebody at the waiting room that I find most productive. So I'm never under pressure when the person I'm waiting for hasn't called me because I have this small uh, Quran where I can just read a few lines while waiting. And um, then says, oh, it's ready for you. Then you get up. But that time hasn't always been wasted. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's really the person. Who, who are you or who have you molded yourself to be? Um, the one that condemns immediately the circumstances they found themselves in or the one that says, this is where I found myself. Uh, some of the best books I've read have been written in prison. You know, this is somebody in incarceration. You're not allowed to go out, no parties, no nothing. And he keeps taking every piece of paper that he finds to scribble something down. By the time his time or her time is over, a book has been, has been written. So it's, it's, it's about golden seed. It's about you developing to make the most of your time um, and the willingness to um, engage productively. You know, not, not the willingness to engage unproductively. That would do well. But to engage productively uh, is what, what we need to continue to boost ourselves and boost our confidence uh, to achieving greater things, in my opinion. Thank you very much for that. I, I think what we're hearing is self-accountability, reflection, and self-improvement is extremely key. I think the other nugget we have gotten from this is golden seeds. And sometimes you have external golden seeds. I think with that self-reflection, you yourself can also act in that capacity. And this almost segues quite perfectly into partnerships and, and how you how those partnerships uh, slash golden seeds have, have seen you build businesses over time. I, I think when you look at the terrain where you have had a strong inflection, it, it, it surpasses financial services, but that is still one of the key parts. Can you walk us through that journey with your joint founder in creating a successful tier one bank and, and what, how, how it evolved and, and, and the thought process and, as well as the leadership lessons from that? Um, it's, it's very, 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 very simple. Um, I came across this statement long ago. Success without succession is as good as failure. Uh, and when I was um, welled up with this idea of a commercial bank, not having been a commercial banker myself, um, we were working in merchant banks at that time, what you call investment banks these days. Uh, but it was clear to me that the direction that we should go was the commercial bank. And I resolved all the issues that were fundamental to me. <clears throat> the next question is, okay, what if on this journey, even before we have, we have put things I put things together to evolve this bank. What if something happened to me, like death? I just died. Was that going to be the end of the idea? And I, I said, it could be. But was that the outcome that I wanted? No. So I was looking for, <clears throat> who did I know that could progress the idea should anything happen to me? The same philosophy that underpins or under, underlies the having of a president in the presidential system and a vice president in, the, in, in that same system. If something happened to the president, we don't have a vacuum. There will be a president, and that is the number, number two. So I was looking for that vice president. Um, and I wanted somebody who could fill my gap, not any other gap. Uh, 
had been able to break the business of banking into compartments. Okay, this is the front desk. Okay, this is the back office. This is this, this is that. I had run their importance uh, in my own mind. Being, being in the in the space. And I looked at people around me uh, and felt that, okay, child doing okay will be that person who will fit best into this slot should anything happen to me. That was what informed his own choice um, to come on that journey with me. Uh, there were other people around <clears throat> who could have, for example, if he, if he had said he wasn't coming on the journey, uh, but his skill to replace myself was quite critical to the, to the choice of um, uh, at, at, at the time. So that's what led to the choice, it was discussed with him, and he didn't find it um, offensive. And I mean that because people have also taken the position that if you could set up a bank, I could also set up set up a bank. Um, but he didn't take that position. But one of the things I said to him was rec to recognize that fact that, oh, of course it could also go in that direction and obtain a bank license. But that if it teamed up with me, the organization that we were going to resolve was going to be bigger than two independent organizations, one led by me and one led by him. Um, he must have been persuaded by that. And uh, the rest is history. Thank you very much, sir. Um, very important point that you gave us there. You said tile, you know, um, you sold synergy to him and he and he got, you know, he, he, that was one of the key things he, he got to come on board, which is, you know, profound for us. Um, one of the other things we would like to know is, of course, beyond you and Tyre, there were other team members. You know, you set up a, your golden seed actually generated a golden baby, you know, one of Nigeria's, you know, most successful stories. Um, so what were those values, you know, you, you know that you couldn't compromise on in, in, in putting together this golden baby, you know, that we have today, one of the most successful tier one banks in Nigeria. Um, what did you look out for in the team that you brought together beyond you and Tyre? The, the, um, the most challenging, okay. Let me put it this way. We needed three things to create the bank. We needed the physical infrastructure, call them the building, where we will sit, where we will work. We also needed the uh, technological infrastructure, the computers and so on and so forth. And then we needed the people. Um, and we realized, I mean, we knew that money alone Will get us the buildings and the computers and so on and so forth. Uh, but what we needed to get people went beyond money. And because I was determined to run a unique organization in this space, unique in the sense that it was going to be faithful, leadership was going to be faithful to everything that we said. Um, and leadership was going to permeate the organization. We, on, we didn't just say customer was king. We needed to philosophically identify with the fact that customer was, was truly and truly king. Uh, but those who are going to make customer king had to be made to understand that they were king makers, okay? And these were people. And these are the ones that you couldn't see through them. Uh, somebody can say to you, I like that thing. And deep inside the person saying they're rubbish. Um, I hate that thing, but there's no way you will know. But there are ways to know if you are trained. So what, what we did was to um, devote a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of energy on people, those who are going to uh, serve the food, those who are going to touch the customer, uh, to be prepared for it. 
Uh, that's how we began to work together to try to create a culture. This is where we will spend most of our time. How do we want to live here? That, that was not something we wanted to legislate. That is something we wanted to evolve amongst ourselves. What did we have to learn other than how to um, do the debits and the credits or how to write the credits, uh, how to lend the money, how to um, dispense the cash and so on and so forth. What do we want to learn that will make us better human beings, first and foremost, or better human beings that now have the skills to be able to dispense cash or to write credit and so on and so forth. And we did spend a lot of money and a lot of time living together. When I say living together, um, before we started coming to work and work was going to the training school, all of us for the whole day, for like five months, trying to build this team. Of course, we suffered attrition in the process. Um, trying to avoid people who had a uh, who had been trained in one particular way of what banks are, to having people who had never worked in, 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 in this place before. And therefore, whatever banking meant to them was what we told them banking was, or what, what we showed them the banking was. Yeah, so, it's, so it's, it was always a people issue. When people work with their soul, if when people did what they wanted to do, what they loved to do, they always did it better than when people are forced to do things. Uh, most people do work today that is not what they would have chosen if they had, if they had a choice. Uh, and when you see those people, I mean, they do it efficiently in most cases because they need the money to survive. But when you find people doing that which they have chosen to do, which they love to do, this happens a lot in football, when you find a true talent, who is playing the game, probably smiling while dribbling, as opposed to somebody who um, just learns how to do it. Uh, and people have brought differences of between this and this, between that and that. Uh, so we try to get people to, if they didn't know that this was what they loved, to start a, considering it and loving it, you know? Uh, and we got a lot of people to a point where attending to customers, dealing with customers, even within the banking space, choosing that particular space where they would like to stand. You know, I mean, there are people who, did it, who do HR in banking. There are people who do cash and teller uh, politely in banking. And I could share experiences with you what we found out. We, we, we tried all those. That's how we began to build the institution. And we extended ownership of that institution. When I say ownership, psychological ownership. The fact that you are working for yourself. You are not working for me. Uh, you are working for yourself and you are part of a team uh, that is rare. Not many people will belong to a group that will be starting a bank that never existed before. Okay, today if somebody joined Guarantee Trust Bank, um, yeah. It's, in fact, for anybody 35 years old and above, the assumption is that the Trust Bank was always there. You are the ones that keep reminding them that come, there's somebody down the road that, that was the founder of the Trust Bank and is still alive. No. Who asked for the founder of First Bank or for the founder of Union Bank or for the founder of UBA? Nobody does. Um, and the hope is that that's part of this. The hope is that Nobody is going to ask for the founder anymore to be able to do business. What they do sufficiently compels people to work in there and do the business with them. So initially, they relied on the uh, uh, credibility and integrity of their founders. And over the years, they built their own credibility as an institution, uh, uh, depend independent of the credibility and integrity of those who founded them. What people then say is that, um, oh, okay, what do you expect? Those who founded them uh, had this credibility. This is the only way they could have brought them up. The same way I refer to my parents as 
This is the only way they could have brought me up. This was, this was who they were, and so on and so forth. So that's how we, we, we handle that aspect. Thank you. Uh, we've heard that it's essentially a governance system, for lack of a of an easier way to put it, a governance system that allows the support ethics, a vision, as well as a feedback loop uh, as people continue to do things. There's almost a uh, self-improvement or organizational improvement at the same time. What we have seen, uh, at least in the last few years in Nigeria, is many entities also trying to take this path that you have, you have thrown. I think they are dealing with the same norms of society uh, that, that would have existed in the 80s as well as in the 90s. And I think the most relevant of them are the fintech entities, for example, who are trying to challenge perhaps more established players as, as we move forward. Would you have any tips for any of these founders or anyone who is considering trying to ploy this path that, that, is, that has been trodden very fantastically by yourselves, but uh, still remains an enigma to many? Okay. Um... You, you, you have to know who you are, first and foremost, number one. And when you know who you are, you need to be true to yourself. There is no, there is no point. What I found is that what we say is very, very good. But what we do is even better. You know, the Americans have been saying that um, um, your action is so loud. I can't hear what you are saying, okay? Uh, if you say to people, this is the way to do it, and you do it another way, those people are seeing you and they are finding that, uh, 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 um, that uh, inconsistency with that which you have told them. So don't, don't, don't deceive yourself. I'll give you an example. When we resumed from training school, I will now open that door to say, okay, this is a bank. Customer coming. Shortly before that, maybe like the day before or day and a half before, I did a memo to everybody, posting everybody to their different departments. We didn't have a bank before. So you go to Treasury, you go to Fincom, you go to Cash and Teller, you go to this. And um, what I used to do was, after a memo, each memo was always addressed to all of us. I never wrote a memo to Mr. John or Miss Jane. Every memo that came out, if anything was worth putting on paper, it was worth receiving by all of us. So I wrote this memo to all of us, posted. And um, of course, Cash and Teller was an intrinsic part of, an uh, integral part of the commercial bank. Customers will come that needed cash, uh, more so then than now. You have, you have cards, you have ATMs. At that time, we didn't have. Okay, so I wrote this memo, and I decided that I wanted to feel the pulse of the firm two hours after the memo had gone out. I started walking around. Not quite, I mean, any distance from my office. I found a young lady crying, it was hysterical actually. And I said, what's the matter? And said, Fola, Fola, there's no problem. Um, it's not your fault. This is what we agreed to do. All I asked was, what was the problem? And this person was talking to me and I didn't know where to pick it from. What's the matter? Um, I was posted to Cash and Teller. And I said, and what was the problem with Cash and Teller? We all agree that we are all playing roles in the bank. And she said, no, 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 I've said it's not your problem. It's not your fault, it's what we agree. Bofola, I took a two one from Unilag Economics. My parents will never understand this. My parents will never understand this. How I ended up in Cash and Teller. And um, I, I didn't know how to solve the problem. I mean, Matthew, I was just 36 and I, I, I received this, okay? Um, what I, I'm gonna do is what we agreed. We all bonded, we all said we'll do wherever we found ourselves and somebody has to do it. And then I, I left her some work, but I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied. And I saw another person 
who had another type of problem. And who are the people who are laughing? The guy who went to treasury, the guy who went to a corporate bank, credit and marketing, and so on and so forth. Those are people. So I went back to my office, and I actually, I was frustrated. And I put my head on my table and I said, God, I have a problem. This lady cannot hit my customer. She's not a happy person. She doesn't like the job that she's been posted to do. You know, I had my head like that for like maybe 15 minutes. You know, sometimes you do it for two minutes and it looks like, like one hour. Okay, so don't, don't take me up, don't, don't hold me to the time. But when I got up, something hit me. If nobody wants to do cash and tell her, um, then all of us must do it. So we remove cash and teller from job we posted people to, to job that we all did. And um, so I, wrote an, I started writing another memo, uh, reposting people, including this particular lady that started the top uh, process for me. And by the time I was done, I think I had created about six groups of people. Um, uh, incorporating every one of us, okay? And I was going to lead the first team that would be cash and teller for Guarantee Trust Bank, all right? Submitting myself to the teller captain. Um, we had a teller captain. We had uh, somebody who would give you the cash. Someone dropping my password, which was universal, to a cash and teller password on the day I was going to serve. And then um, everybody in the bank became a cash and teller uh, operative. Now, the, the, the joy factor in the system shut up beyond recognition. And then I missed out some people, about four or five people. I don't know what led to their missing out. Come and see the charge to my, to my office. Why is my name not on the list? Why am I not serving on the list? That was the job that nobody wanted to do, that we converted to the job that everybody wanted to do because it's not a badge of honor. And um, but the reason I told you the story um, was because everybody in the ecosystem in, in Lagos, they soon found out that we all did cash and teller and that the managing director, you could run into the managing director of the bank and to dispense your cash to you. If you are, I mean, on the, if you monitor him well enough, and there were sufficient enough young people who could tell you the day for that was serving, or the day Tayo was serving, or the day this person was serving, and you could come in there and you find us there. Um, and nobody copied it. No, nobody did it. So the point is, we were faithful to it. It was who we were. Serving was not our problem. And if people felt that serving was their problem, um, they couldn't do it. it there's nothing to, 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 to go to school to learn about that, just to see. But no, you couldn't find any other CEO in this marketplace that served as teller or his deputy or senior people. That was a guaranteed trust bank uh, uh, DNA, and we stuck to that. So know yourself. Know yourself. It should have been a disaster if we had said everybody would serve as Stella and then I would start missing it or Tyre would start avoiding it. Yeah, of course, it's going to collapse. Uh, but because we were faithful to it, everybody, everybody did it and everybody did it well. Sorry, I think the, the answer was too long for the question that you asked. But, that was uh, fantastic. Over to you, Paula. It was. It was fantastic, as, as, as Samuel has said. Thank you so much, sir. So now we're going to move to family. Um, I'd like you to comment on how, the role your family played in determining your success. Um, what, what role did your spouse play? Especially, you know, starting a, a bank, at, you know, in your early um, family life, you know, what role did she play? What role did the family play in ensuring that you, were, you remained successful? Um, it, it was a very trying period. Uh, and I'll tell you trying from this perspective. 
like I said, I was a bundle of confidence. I never thought that um, um, I would suffer or what, what, what was the aspiration? Do well at work. If you're able to become one of the three most senior person in a corporate, in a, in a, in a corporate, then fine. That was the picture of uh, success at that time. And things were on course. But this was going to be different. This was going to be creating an enterprise and leading that enterprise on the basis of your own values, of your own, influenced by your own values, um, on, the, on, on your terms and conditions, bringing people together. One of the, there, there's nothing wrong with how you spend your money. Uh, it's your money. You are your board. You are the one that reports yourself. But the moment, the moment you have a drop of OPM, other people's money, in the basket, things change drastically. You become accountable, right? Even if we're talking of a thousand naira and somebody just has five naira in that mix, believe me, the person has acquired the right to ask questions, right? Why are you spending it in this manner? And it's not enough to say, hey, hey, hey give me a break. How much do you have there? No, 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 no. Guys, it, 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 it's become an impuri uh, 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 impurity. It's, no long, it's not your money. The money that you must account for. And that's one of the things that we need to learn here. That OPM comes with responsibility. Now, relating it to family, what we needed to set up the bank at that time was 20 million naira. Most of you will laugh. That was all that we needed. 20 million naira. And we did not have 20 million naira of our own. Uh, I didn't have, Tyro didn't have. So we had to raise money. The same way people are raising 25 billion naira today. I tell you, it was the way we raised 20 million naira. At the time, we raised 20 million naira. And it comprised 100,000, half a million. We decided that we would not take more than a million naira from anybody because we didn't want. Um, a warlord, you know, we didn't want one, one person that gave instruction. So if everybody put a million down to raise 20 million, that's 20 people. Okay, some degree of egalitarianism will, will, will seep in. But we didn't have 20 people who had a million who they, who they could put down. And we had limited those who had more than a million to one million, okay? So we took 100,000, 250,000, 200,000, half a million. At the end of the day, we had 42 people um, committing. At the, when push became shove, we had 41 people actually putting down the money. One person uh, backing out, which was a, a very good, um, a very good um, return for those who raised who raise money. Um, from that moment onward, family became less important. Uh, you had to devote yourself, one, primarily to the preservation of other people's money. Uh, and you were hoping that family will understand that if this venture goes well, it will break completely from uh, from poverty and um, lifestyle will change. Well, it was a very, it was for me personally, I don't think I handled it well. Uh, it was extremely testy uh, and I gave consideration, possibly over consideration to the fact that I, I was holding other people's money and I had to make sure that the enterprise succeeded and that all my family needed to do was to bear with me for a few years and I will have returned the money to the people and we'll be back to where we were. Uh, I didn't communicate that effectively. I didn't communicate that uh, uh, as well as I know how to communicate things today. Perhaps if I had, 
it may, it may not have been difficult. Um, but yes, that was that was the the, 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 the challenge that I had uh, at, at at the time. So I just chose one that couldn't talk over one that could talk back and say, "Come, um, this is this is paining me or this is stretching me." Uh, in the in the belief that if I didn't hear, right, mm -hmm. I would mind. Uh, but just maybe there are better ways of doing it. But that was how how I handled it. Okay, thank you for your candle, and I think uh, as it, it's something that I think we all we all understand and we all feel, especially members of the CFA society and I guess larger people who are trying to attain some level of success. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have a very strong commitment to solving unemployment. You see this, whether it's via setting up entities yeah, or even the Fate Foundation, which one of its key credences is, is uh, to help solve unemployment. ICSL also uh, helping provide uh, jobs for, for, for persons that live in Nigeria and even outside of Nigeria. What's your thinking behind these organizations and why is unemployment quite key? Um, it, it, to solve from your perspective? Um, there's no, there's no good that comes out of, of the idle mind. No good at all. It, it hurts society. Um, when Lord Beveridge wrote his report in 1941, 1942, and it came across the five giant evils in the UK. Uh, it described the people of vile donors as one which destroys wealth. You know, uh, uh, the evil of vile donors it came out with five, five giant evils. I've written copiously uh, about that. But the way it described the evil of vile donors was one that destroys wealth. You know, um, why will a human being wake up in the morning? and have nothing to fill the void and then go back to bed in the evening. What, what kind of life? And the way we are encountering them today is indeed determining what to do with that void. Um, some say the, the, the uh, idleness is the, is the devil's workshop, you know, when, when, when the, yeah, and my, and, I want to say that the hallmark of a, of a good society is where men and women are put to work, children are in school. Uh, that is the first sign of order in a society. Somebody wrote an article in the paper yesterday and quoted Thomas Friedman, where he said, to the unemployed, there is nothing like 4% 4, 4 unemployment in a system. I, it's 100% unemployment if I have nothing uh, to do. So I believe that society's primary, one of society's primary obligations is to create an environment where men and women are engaged on a full time, unless they are sick, unless they are incapacitated, um, but they have to be engaged. And then, you know, it's even, engagement even removes all the idle talks that, all, all, the, all, the, all the evil machinations that we, we contrive when you are busy. If you get to work at eight and you close at five, by the time you get home, you are tired. There's less time for vigil, you know, for a man to go into your mind and say to you that this is how God looks. You can find that out by yourself, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and so on and so forth. But when you don't, when you are not fully occupied or occupied at all, anybody can pray, pray on your mind um, because it's just wandering and available to those who pray. And that's why my own devotion um, to employment just kept people to work, get people to work not to talk of the return on investment of what their parents or they themselves invested 
to put themselves in a position where they can begin to serve and 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 money. Who wants to uh, be going back home in their thirties to collect money for food, money for pans, money for comb? We did that when we were young, you know, and we now ought to be doing it for our children. There are so many people my age who are paying their grandchildren uh, our school fees uh, for different reasons, but significantly because their children are poorly employed or unemployed um, at all. That way we will never, we will never build a modern society. Thank you for that. Um, I think there are many things that have gone around the Nigeria brain drain, and I, I think this all essentially partly answers that question. Uh, we've seen significant flights of, of, of persons, especially persons that can help build our societies, and, 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 and either it be Canada or the UK, I think many of these societies have taken advantage. Uh, your, your point of thinking around employment is very key. And I think in, in looking at it from that perspective, perhaps we even kill two, two, two birds with one stone as a country. We'll, we'll move on to, and, and because we are essentially running through time, we'll move on to perhaps the bit more cultural parts of, of leadership in, in, in a country like Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria, similar to many other emerging markets, believes in filial piety. Filial piety being unbridled respect and obedience for one's elders. Now that cultural, that culture is very distinct and has very, very many positives. Um, however, sometimes it's reinterpreted as not being able to challenge um, the powers that be, whether it be elders or any uh, institutional uh, authorities. What are your thoughts on this? And what ways have you been able to challenge the status quo and persons and, and what advice uh, advice would you give uh, others trying to do the same? I saw an obituary by the by a state government yesterday, um, and it described the person as a, a gallant military administrator. Everybody that has uh, been at, at custody of this country as president or as governor, um, we've gone into defining them in extraordinary terms. And yet the place looks like this, a completely disordered environment. Uh, you look at a, 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 a minister of finance at some point, you say, oh, an outstanding administrator. You look at um, a president, say, uh, a great Ni illustrious son of Nigeria, and so on and so forth. And I keep, keep saying to myself, okay, when you look at the result, which is what we have today, and these are the people who have been in charge, um, and we describe them as illustrious and this and that and that, I think it's, 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 it's a challenge for me. It's a challenge for me. The managing director of a bank is supported by six armed policemen just because he wants to come from bank A to bank B, or he wants to go home. Um, and I ask myself, why? What, 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 what is he running from? Uh, but it seems to be the normal thing. I never, I never did it all through my tenure, and I was CEO for 12 years. We, it wasn't the culture that we, we, I mean, we still drove ourselves to, to the barbers and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to understand where the culture has, uh, whether that is the culture or that we, the one that we have evolved, um, because in those days, we moved around in this society very, very freely. And it's in, 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 in these modern time, times that we need to protect, uh, we need to protect ourselves. When I'm done with this lecture, I'm going to um, Victoria Island, and I'm driving myself to Victoria Island, by myself, and that's fine for me. And people keep wondering, why, why do you do that? Because where I'm going has no parking challenge. Um, and I like to drive anyway. But it's what we have made ourselves to become. Uh, and there are people who visit me these days who just come in with their own cars because they believe that that's what I want to see. But outside my gates, okay, they have kept their, their policemen and so on and so on. And I thank them for 
respecting my own values. Uh, because by the time you descend um, six policemen with guns into my compound, we are going to be terrified. We're not used to that. Um, uh, I want to go to a bell with and people are asking me, do you have a patrol in front of you? Do you have a patrol behind you? I said, it's 19 minutes away. I said, ha, the place, so far I've gone, so far I've returned, and I didn't have uh, any patrol. So it, it's, it's something that we feed we feed. And the more we feed it, the more it grows. And then it grows to a point where um, we are terrified of it. And it begins to become, it's become a monster that begins to control us. Uh, and I don't know when, you know, there's a reinforcing loop at the moment. I don't know when we are going to create the balancing mm -hmm. loop that will reverse it. But maybe as individual, you can also ask yourself, those four policemen are doing with them. Um, let them go and do the job that they are paid to do to govern I and mean, to protect society as, as opposed to protect one person. Uh, but maybe I don't have a good answer here. These are my thoughts that I've just, I've just shared. All I know is that I will live my own life the way I know how to live it. And I have so many friends who have police. And we do meet at places, and they enter their car. So one of them said to me recently, he said, ah, if not for these people, I also like to drive. And I pitied him, you know, if not for the, his, his, his hands, those who are minding his mind that is something you are on my feet. He has mind that, you know, when he removes his jacket, somebody takes it from him, his, his own jacket. I, I, I really don't know what he wants to carry there. Um, and, and so on and so forth. But it's not for me to condemn his life. He knows why, why he's living that kind of life. I can't see it, but he can, he can see. You know? um, but that is the, that is, I consider it as part of the tragedy of my environment at this time. Um, and it's up to us, particularly those who are younger than us, to look at the different lifestyle that we can see and say to themselves, this is not the one I want, this is the one I want, and be faithful to you. That's, that's very clear. Um, the next question is really around isms. I, I think this is topical, I guess, as, 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 as many young persons particularly start to question, uh, I guess, the rules of operations uh, in, in society. And this is the world over, not just Nigeria. And there are many isms, uh, whether it's racism, even though perhaps it's not in that same form in Nigeria, there's a lot of ageism also, there is sexism. Um, yeah. And, and, and this, the, these are the isms that uh, many, many persons have to grapple with. And some people have to grapple with all of them at the same time. What is your advice to young female and male, um, uh, young men and women facing this daily, daily reality as they try to prove themselves in, in the world? Um, are there any examples you can share to support um, some, some of your advice to, 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 to us, essentially? Um, maybe I'm the wrong person to ask as to how do we order the world, but I'll share what I know with you. What, what does this person have to put on the table, right? And if we put what we have on the table as efficiently and as competently as possible, there's a tendency for us to compel those who are in charge of our organization to begin to respect us, okay? If, but if we have less than is required, we will know that we have less than, than is required. And there's a tendency for us to want to um, get more with the less. And therefore, a lot of compromises may set in. Clearly there are bad people who want to exploit other people. But if you let your deeds, your work um, be outstanding, I believe that it will go a long way to insulate uh, uh, the effect. But if we keep asking for, um, if you keep asking for some 
some form of justice that people may not be able to relate with at some time, then we we we, we run into this um, we run into this problem. I want to go to Enugu. I want to go to Enugu by air. My desire is to be flown to Enugu by the best pilot. It has never been by my brother, the pilot, if he's the one that is crashing planes uh, up and down. If I find him at the airport and he, say, he asks me where I'm going, I say, I'm going to Enugu. And he says, oh, it is going to Enugu. I'm going to tell him that I want to branch him the name first. Let him be, let him be carrying his plane to Enugu. Because I don't want to go with him. I want to go with, with, with the best person. If I'm sick, I want the best doctor to attend to me. Uh, that doctor does not have to be male or does not have to be female, does not have to be Igbo, does not have to be Hausa. That is the kind of um, uh, resolution that we can take in our own mind, that whatever it is that I do, I will do it. I will be the best person, uh, the, the best person known for it. There's a story of the sweeper uh, who died and they felt that this was the best sweeper they've ever found. Just sweeping the floor. The person swept the, the floor with joy, eh? and everybody knew that that floor was going to be swept, and this place was going to be like that. There are people who leave their homes and travel miles to go to their barbers, because there's a particular way that that particular person cuts their hair that gives them joy. Women especially, their hairdressers, and so on and so forth. Their pastors, how they preach, let us extend ourselves and be the best that we can, continuously improving, right? If we saw this work, I would say this is fantastic. The next work is not a pity. I don't think anybody subjects that kind of person to any form of discrimination or punishment. People look for the person. And if they don't appreciate the person in the organization in which the person works, there are other organizations that will have felt the uh, or, or, yeah, felt the, the person, even though they were not in their place, that are queuing behind to get that person. And those who lose such people regret losing them. In fact, in football, they've had to go and pay more to bring them, to bring them back. Just be the best that you can be. Uh, that's what you can control. You know, every other thing is not in your hand. But if you focus on that which you can control, then that becomes the best and it begins to control other things that you didn't think that you have power to control before. That, that's very clear. And I see that we've mentioned football a few a few times, but we're not going to ask what club you support. Just <laughs> I enjoy the game. Yes. Um, I, I think we're about concluding now and we'll ask our final question um, from the moderators before handing and ask, getting questions from the audience. And, and the last question is really about advice. What advice do you give to young uh, future Nigerian leaders today? And, and that's looking at across all spheres. Okay. So many things come to mind, but what I, um, what I think is uppermost in my own mind is why do I want to lead? You know, what, what, why do I want to lead? Why don't I just allow somebody else to do it? And my finding is that so many people want to lead just for the benefit of the position as opposed to the legacy or the impact they're going to have on society. Um, leading is um, very, very, uh, I put it this way, the, the punishment for failed, for failure of leadership is, 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 is heavy. Why do you want to go and put yourself through that if you have no plan just to show that you are the president or you are the governor? So you look at so many people who occupy these positions and don't, don't have any plan. Uh, they're hurting us. So can we first of all decide what it is that we want to we want to achieve? That's number one. Number two, um, it's not it's not the best for somebody having done a job and putting that job to keep pointing fingers that every one of my successors uh, has failed. They're not as good as me. 
What was your job if not producing people, you know, who will take over from you? It has to be me or nobody else. Life cannot continue in that manner. So I've read about these great Nigerians um, who have, like I said, uh, but this is what we find as a country today. Can we try to break that cycle and let somebody even lead towards a legacy to say, oh, these were the things that we were achieved, these were the things that we put in place, and those who succeed them carry on better with that which they have which they have begun, you know. If and for the leadership to know that, you know, at some point, it, it cannot be one man for all seasons, you know. At some point, mine will expire and then other people will progress from there and nurture uh, 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 sufficiently and deliberately those other people and put them in a position. For everyone that is exiting, let us have 10, that any of 10 that can replace them and let the difference just be uh, strawberry or vanilla, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. I, I think if we're able to do that, Number two, you know, an uneducated populace. It's a hopeless populace, totally hopeless. There's nothing you can do. We need to get people in school to, on, to be able to read and write, to be able to hear in the language of our communication so that they can be useful to themselves to in, in creating a better society. And telling us that government cannot do all, um, cannot be an answer. Uh, to solving this problem. I, I believe that in Nigeria today, everybody should have a right to primary education in a qualitative manner, minimum. And then let's, let's, let's take it up from there. But again, this is not a platform to write a manifesto. Yeah, you ask me a question and I will, I will, um, I will leave it there. Thank you. I, I think your answer just showed uh, extreme passion, uh, which is another trait. Uh, that we see in, in, in good leaders. Uh, I think at this point, we'll open up for Q&A and, and Paula will be leading that. Thank you very much again, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Samuel. Thank you so much uh, for the words of wisdom. A lot of them, my just are so full. I'm sure all of us have gained one or two things. So we're gonna go into the um, Q&A sessions. I already have a few questions here. The first, which I think you already answered, but maybe for the person and other people that just joined. Um, the person asked, as the MD of GT Bank, what was your leadership philosophy behind occasionally serving as a teller on the bank floor during your, your years? So I think we explained that already. Yes. Nobody wanted to do it, okay? <laughs> um, so any job, I have found that any job that nobody wants to do, let's all do it. Um, let's all do it. It was a solution to a challenge that I had at a point early in the game, or even before we opened. Yeah. Okay, the second question says, what are the most difficult challenge you encountered as a founder of GT Bank and a leader? The challenges or most difficult one? Again, I have discussed it. I mean, human beings are the most uh, difficult challenges because they are the ones that can, that can veil that which is, is, is there. You know, is this place paining you? know, And that's where you are receiving the greatest pain. Only human beings are, are, are capable. But the other experience I had is regulation. Um, we tend to also have created a system where the, the regulator uh, did may not have seen their job in the, in the perspective that the job is. It's to create an enabling environment, sanction when uh, 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 infractions, and so on and so forth. But OK, maybe sometimes regulator, regulators bully. And it's not limited to the financial space. We have regulators in the telecom space. We have regulators in, in other spaces. I hope our regulators will begin to understand that they have a duty to build 
the industry that they regulate. And if the industry fails, regulation, there's nothing to regulate if we don't have the uh, industry. We didn't have a problem with ourselves in the bank and we didn't have a problem with our customers. As a matter of fact, our customers loved us uh, and they requited our efforts by the stupendous uh, growth in every index, you know, almost all indices that we resulted. Um, and we enjoyed ourselves. We loved what we did and we were happy doing it. And we also were happy telling people that this is where we work, uh, which is very important. Thank you, sir. One question that someone, a lot of people have asked is, do you have a mentoring program um, that they can sign up for a leadership <laughs> mentoring program? A couple of people have asked that question. Okay, um, let me say, answer clearly, no. But I also feel that we get into, we get into a psyche that then begins to govern uh, at the form. We, we, at this, it's a psyche of form over substance. All, I mean, when I was growing in my thirties, founding the bank and so on and so forth, the word mentoring wasn't popular, okay? And yet we were able to do things. Today, people feel that um, they need to have somebody call their mentor. Or, no, you don't need to. Um, so much resides in books, particularly biographies, right? You can read about the lives of people. Uh, you can engage people you work with, not, ju not just those who are your, your senior, your, your, your peers, you can engage them. There are organizations, several of them, who claim that the mentor uh, are people and they sign people on to partner with other people. Again, that's the bane of, of, of society. Um, just be lucky that you're not paired with somebody whose values or ethics you don't know are uh, alien to, to, to yourself. I think we can chart this course without formalizing a relationship of mentor mentee uh, as something like a, bro like a brother and a sister, a younger brother and an older brother, a father and a child. Those natural relationships are okay, but you can forge. I used to go, I used to visit a friend of mine called Bismarck Iwane when I was a young. Uh, officer in Continental and he was in IMB. Um, I never called this man my mentor, but any time I wanted to discuss something about treasury, I found him a fresh mind and I'll put a call through to him at any time and he was okay, let's do five o'clock. I mean, that's after work. And Bismarck and I will sit down and talk. I may not see Bismarck for another six months or, or one year, but up to today, I've never said, oh, Bismarck was my mentor. No, we were just available uh, uh, to me the way I've been available to other people. Everybody that has come to me to say they wanted me to be their mentor, I said, no, it's such a, a huge task for me. I don't want to uh, moralize for people. I don't want to, no, 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 no. Let me just continue to perfect my own imperfections on my own journey. Whatever it is that you want to discuss, if you know my number or you can reach me, call me. I've never said, no, I don't want to discuss with people who I don't want to be a mentor. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I think as, as we see some of these questions come through, uh, at the very start we said, this is unedited. However, our approach is going to be pragmatic, constructive, and positive. Thus, uh, I guess the questions we ask will always be in that light. Uh, th there's, there's a question that has been asked, and, 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 and essentially it's come in two ways. Uh, and the first one is, when are you writing your autobiography? And the second part to it is, what books have influenced you thus far? Okay. When am I writing your, my autobiography? I think I'm getting ready now. And the reason that I said so is that I believe that a man, a, a human being has to allow the effluxion of time mm -hmm. on things that occurred. Otherwise, it would be a me book as opposed to an ideas uh, book. The way, when I reflect now and I look at some issues that have occurred, my, my reflections are different from my feeling at the time that they occurred. But I believe that now I'm getting close to 
70. Yeah, I think I, I have but acquired the maturity. I've looked at the issues a bit differently, and I may be able to uh, put them put them in writing. I pray that I I, I succeed at that. Uh, I'm I'm clear what my what my views are on so many of these issues. What was the second part of the question? And the second part was what books have influenced you? So many. So I used to read them one a week before. Um, I've gone a bit slower now because I do uh, uh, some other things. Um, one of the most interesting books for me is that you the road less traveled uh, by a gentleman called Scott Peck. It's, um, I find it very fascinating. I've read it too many times. Uh, I, I, I suggest it to people. But biography is typically an experience uh, books that um, interest me a lot. Thank, thank you very much for that. Oh, or am I free? I, I think we have come to a wrap on this. Um, um, and for the audience, that still has quite a few questions. The memoirs will be out very soon. We'll be taking orders at the right time. Uh, and the contract I'll, uh, <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> yes. So uh, I will hand over to Chuka uh, of the CFA Society to, to wrap up. Thank you again very much, sir, for your time. And, and, and the words have been very uh, uh, inspirational as well as um, uh, awesome, uh, for lack of a, <laughs> yes. So over to you, Fuka. So, okay. wow, this is a book on Chuka, if you don't mind. Wow, um, if I'm permitted to actually jump in. So, I'd want to ask you a question, just a quick one, using my <laughs> veto power. Um, <laughs> thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, there's a question on the chat that seems interesting to me, and it talks around um, how do we tackle the corruption and how does the average person in Nigeria ensures um, that um, the adequate um, values are ended to? And my own personal question for you, which um, I'd want to ask is, what's one of your greatest um, regrets as a younger person? What would you tell yourself now that a mistake or something that happened then that would guide people like us um, in ensuring we don't journey or go down the route on those tasks. Sorry, Sam and Paula. <laughs> I just thought I should, since we still have 10 minutes with him, I didn't want him to go without asking that question. And then the third question for me is on the question of your transition from being the managing director of first, um, sorry, of Guarantee Trust Bank. How did you make that decision to leave, even though there was not a regulation at that time that required you to leave that position? What was the driving force behind this? And okay. those are the three questions I have for you. Okay. The how do we tackle corruption? Um, I may agree that I've become cynical. Uh, I may uh, be perceived that I've become, I've become cynical. I don't think we want to tackle corruption. That's my, that's my problem. Uh, because we all know how to tackle corruption. But I don't think as a system, as a, as, as a collective, is what we want to do. I think we all wait for our opportunity uh, to be able to engage in it. Uh, so, really, there's no point in uh, so making suggestions as to how it should be tackled when we haven't taken a decision collectively that it is uh, adversarial to us. 
and we want to tackle it. I don't think we want to tackle it. And I don't like engaging in conversations that don't come with sincerity. Greatest regret. I also don't operate like that. You know, if I knew then what I know now, that's not my, that's not my, what drives me. What drives me is with what I know now, um, how do I tackle the future? Because um, it doesn't help me if I knew then what I know, what I know now. So I keep asking myself with what I know now. I, I didn't know then what I know now. So I have acted with the information and the ability and the capacity that I had at that, part, at that point in time. So, um, but I do wish that some things were not the way they were, okay, but it has very little to do with what, what I knew then. But transition from an, an managing director to uh, a life without the title managing director. The Antitrust Bank was, from my own spirit and soul, was always beyond me. And I was clear in my mind that it needed to succeed. You know, it, 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 it had to remain beyond me, okay? And the one significant way that Guarantee Trust Bank was going to do so was to witness a transition in my own lifetime, okay? It's like I had to, um, I had to, Throw myself under the under the bus, as they say, for Guarantee Trust Bank to continue its own journey. And um, I came to that conclusion, and I accepted that as my own fate, uh, as it were. That Tayo had to succeed, me. and um, I was glad that I did for so many reasons. Uh, it showed people that it could be done. Okay, and that we could do it. Number two, the bank continued to grow. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I could have grown it uh, as, as, as big as it became, but that point is moved. The bank continued to grow and continued to, to thrive until the point that he also exited, even though under unfortunate circumstances, and somebody else took over. Uh, from him. And we pray, we pray that that process is not truncated uh, because it's no longer within our control what to do with that process. Um, but we hope that uh, we've seen the benefit of handing over. At the time I was doing so, um, just to start that took over from me, but 10 people, any of 10 people could have, could have been, uh, except that we have seniority, uh, at that time that I was living, there were so many people that you know, and so many people that you know that have gone to do great things themselves. So Guarantee Trust Bank was not just producing for itself, it was producing for the system. And so many of them in different spheres, I mean, one of them ended up becoming a deputy governor of Lagos State at some point. People have gone to acquire banks. Um, even people who did not report to people who did not report to people who did not report to me have served as managing directors of corporations. Um, something happened, and we thank God that we were the, the, the agents of that. So it was for the, um, since 1990 philosophy, in other words, in 200 years' time, 300 years' time, it will be since 1990, and it will be impactful at that time. Um, that's why. Uh, we did this. Uh, and it was not an easy thing to do because you weren't forced to do it. You weren't sacked. The regulation didn't force you. The board didn't ask you. Uh, and you just threw yourself into it. And you woke up one morning the day after. And you weren't going to that place that you used to go before. And then you needed something. And you have to now call at me and hope that they will show you some kindness in responding to you. And it, it, it required its own winning uh, period. But you know, that was in 2002. This is 2021. And we have survived. And we haven't died. And we have done other things. 
And therefore, for those who are reluctant to let go, the only time you can let in is to let go first, because there's so much that your hand can hold at any point in time. Um, and it's something that, yes, I said it was not easy, but it's now nice to talk about, I feel like um, um, some, some person from Mars that could do this kind of thing. And it, give, it, it, it has its own lasting uh, pleasure and taste in the mouth. Well, thank, thank you for asking me that question. Thank you. We are closer to 12.30 now. So we'd like to thank you again, sir, for, for, for joining us on this maiden edition of the Quarterly Leadership Series uh, by the CFA Society. Uh, the words of wisdom have been impactful on all our society members as well as uh, others who have joined. Uh, the CFA in, 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 its, in, in, its, in its own right is trying to essentially promote ethics as well as a, 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 more, uh, a, a more balanced way of, 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 of engaging in our society as well as within our various institutions, some of them being financial. Um, and, and this is something we're going to continue to push. We thank you once again, and, and, and to all the members who have joined this, thank you for joining, and hopefully uh, we've learned a thing or two or three uh, from this session. Thanks again, all, and, and look forward to further engaging uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Have thank a wonderful you. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. I can leave? Yes, you, sir. You can, sir. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Have a good one.